let's go ahead and pray real quick. Dear Lord, we love you. We're grateful for you. It's an honor to be able to be in this room with these people today, both those that are physically here, those that are watching online somewhere around the country. Lord, it's an honor to be able to hang out with them, hang out with you. And I do pray, like we pray every week, that you would speak to us individually. Give us what it is that we need before we walk out of this room so that we, when we do walk out of this room, we can walk out differently than the way that we walked in. We thank you in advance for what's going to be an incredible day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I'm glad that you're here. We're in the third week of this series that we started a couple of weeks ago, obviously. And uh, it's called Toxic Vibes, and it's a series all about all the difficult people, the toxic people that are in your life. And here's what we've kind of realized, and this is what you'll see, those of you that haven't been here for this series yet, is two weeks ago we talked about critical people. Last week we talked about manipulative people. Today we're going to talk about the overly needy people that are in your life. And here's how it usually works so far. Every single week, this is how it works. You're going to think of people in your mind as I'm talking, and you're going to uh, think of their names and think of their faces. And some of you, you're going to realize they're sitting right next to you. And so as a result, uh, I already told you, let the Holy Spirit speak to their heart, not you, not your elbow. Don't point at them. Uh, don't point things out, you know, because I can see, y'all don't know that I can see everything. I can see everything from I'm up here, and some of you, your responses are hilarious, and I don't even know how you're still married after some of your responses, uh, or you're still together because they are hilarious. You're, it's like the person who whispers, but they don't know how loud they are when they whisper. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, that's how some of you are. Whenever you are trying not to look to the left or right, you make it even worse. So just as an FYI, just look straight at me. We're going to do this thing together if you're watching online. Same thing. Don't look at the person across from you at Starbucks or wherever it is that you're tuning in from. But we do want to talk about some stuff today because I think that it's going to be helpful. If you haven't listened to the last couple of weeks, messages, go back and you can listen to them, watch them. Uh, for me, when I go to the gym, I, I listen to music whenever I'm doing the weight stuff, uh, but then whenever I move over to the treadmill, which I despise, uh, but anytime I move to the treadmill, I turn on some preaching and just try to like get my brain right, but maybe that is what you need to do over the course of the next couple of days is go back and listen to uh, this past series. It's been really, really good, a lot of fun. I want to jump in though, because we don't have a lot of time. And in order to do so, I want to give you like eight things first. You don't need to write all these down. These are just going to be like eight signs that you might be the needy person potentially because here's what's happened so far every week is you think of the person who is either critical, manipulative, needy, whatever. But what will also happen is you'll start to recognize that you have some of these tendencies as well. And, and that's okay. You're, go you're going to. That's part of it. That's called being self-aware. If you have any self-awareness at all, you will find yourself in some of these uh, messages. If you don't have any self-awareness, you will only ever think of other people. Uh, but you need to know, if you only think of other people, you're the person that a lot of other people are thinking about because you don't have the awareness to know any better. Does that make sense? Say yes. All right, so we're going to be equal opportunity offenders here. I struggle with some of these just like you do. It's going to be okay. Let's just expose it, and then we'll move on together, right? So eight signs that you might be one of the manipulate. No, 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 this is the, manipula the manipulation. This is the needy one. Eight signs that you might be a little bit overly needy. Here's one, right? Uh, the first one, your identity is really tied up in other people's opinions of you. Like your identity is really tied up in other people's opinions of you. For me, this was worse when I was younger. It's gotten significantly better as I got older, but that's not always the case for all people. For me, it just has. It's gotten better. A lot of you, your opinion of yourself is wrapped up and contingent on what it is that somebody else has either said to you or about you. And that's where you get your self-worth. If that's true, it means that you are a needy person. Here's, here's another one. The second one is you overreact about everything all the time. Like you overreact about it could be anything, and you're going to overreact about it. You overreact about what somebody posted online. You overreact about what you saw on the news. You overreact about uh, what they did or didn't bring you at the restaurant. You are an overreactor. You overreact, overreact when you're on the road. 
I do this sometimes. I started to notice it with my children. One of um, my girls, London, said yesterday, we were driving. She goes, Dad, how does it feel? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, you have created three children that all have road rage just like you. That's what she said. (laughs) Because I'll be driving. And y'all know they've been doing all this road work on Cobb Parkway everywhere. Just road work, road work, road work. And we got stuck in it the other day. And it was driving me crazy. And I was like yelling at Bryce, like, Bryce, stop yelling at the people. And I'm thinking, like I said out loud, that's my job. Let me yell at the people. You, I don't know, like pray or something. You pray for the people and I'll yell at the people. Why they were doing it at 8 p.m., I have never, I have no idea. They should have done it at 2 in the morning, not 8 p.m. while I'm still on the road. That's, now had I been off the road at 8, they could start at 8. They did not consult with me, which I do not agree with, but that probably makes me, um, I don't know if that makes me needy. It makes me weird. Number three. You never stop texting, right? Like, remember I told you I see everything? Some of you literally just put your phone down when I said that. Uh, it, it's okay because some of you, you probably need a sign that says I'm not, like during this message, I'm not texting, I'm taking notes. That's great. Um, but if you're always texting people, always, it means you're needy because you feel like you always have to be involved in every single thing. You have to be in the know. You have to know what's going on. You have to be interacting with other people because that's where you find your validation. So as a result, you're always texting. It doesn't just mean you're addicted to your phone, which aren't most of us. Yes. Let me answer that question for you. Yes. It's just if you're always texting, always, I mean, always, it means that you are, hey, you're a wonderful person, but you're just really needy. Uh, Number four extreme jealousy in your relationships, extreme jealousy. I'm not talking about like, oh, they're gone and they're having fun and I miss them and I wish they were here and that makes me sad. Not that. I'm talking about like, you are weird. Like, you are extremely jealous and you're mad for three months about everything that's going on because you weren't there or you weren't invited or you didn't get to go or somebody else talked to somebody and now you're furious. Extreme jealousy is a sign It's a sign of manipulation, too, but it's a sign of being needy. Here's another one. Flip side of that. You never miss the person that you're in a relationship with because you're never apart. (laughs) I knew that one was going to hit different because it did at 832. Some people are like, oh, that's cute. No, it's not cute. It's psychotic. (laughs) If you can't ever be apart, that's not a sign of true love. That's a sign of... Some massive issues. I'm just gonna, I've learned. I, I say this sometimes, but in 13 years of being a pastor, I've learned when, when it gets tense, you just camp out in the moment. And that's, I mean, that's seriously where we are. Like, you, you have got to, you got to figure this out, right? Say yes. People live here. People, if you, if you can't be a part, it doesn't mean you are head over heels in love. No, it means you're head over heels insane. Sometimes it's good to be apart. I've had married people, and this is not just with a person that you're romantically involved with. It could be your kids. I've had people say, I haven't been on a date with my wife since we had kids, and their kids are nine. And I'm like, that's not good. It's not good for you. It's also not good for your kids. You want your kids to grow up and be healthy? Let them see that your love for each other supersedes your love for them even. That'll mess you up. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother message for a whole nother day. You want your kids to be secure? Let them know that there's a united front at home that they can't come in between. Amen. It's, it's a whole nother thing. That's not, this isn't a marriage series or anything, but it is what it is. Number six, a social media obsession. I'm not talking about social media being bad. It's not bad. I got social media. It's not bad. It's great. It's a great tool. Actually, it can be great. It can be stupid, but it can be great. (laughs) Social media obsession is just like you are obsessed with how many likes did I get? How many comments did I get? How many shares did I get? And listen to me because you need to hear me say this. There's nothing wrong with wanting those. That's okay. That's kind of the point. So there's nothing wrong with wanting that. But if that's where you find your worth, if When you get 20 new followers in five minutes, if you like feel better about yourself, that's an issue with idolatry and with insecurity. 
if you feel bad about yourself because you lost some people or because not enough people liked your post and somebody else posted after you and they got way more interaction than you did and you feel bad about yourself? I'm not talking about like, oh, that wasn't a good post. I should adjust. Not that. I'm talking about, oh, I am not accepted. I am not worthy. I am not as good. They must be better. Woe is me. I'm a terrible person. Where's my cake? Like that. Is that not what you do whenever you're sad? I, I think of cake. <laughs> I'm not allowed to have cake, but, but if I was allowed to have it, that's what I would eat. I would only ever eat cake if that was a thing. <laughs> strawberry cake. Yes. Jesus eats strawberry cake. Yes, he does. Those of you shaking your head, you need to give your life to the Lord. <laughs> no idea what that has to do with anything. <laughs> Relationally, if you move way too fast... Have you ever met the person, they meet somebody, they go to Six Flags, and they accidentally sat next to each other on Goliath, and by the time they got off, they've already said, I love you, and the, somebody's planning for the children. <laughs> Listen, word to the wise, you need to run from that person. Not like now, if you're already married to them, don't run from them. You already made that bed, you got to lay in it. I'm talking about if you're on the front end. Because that's a little bit that's a little bit weird. You gotta be careful. If you move way too fast, it's a sign that you're a little bit needy. Here's another one. I think this is number eight. If not, number next. A desperate need of constant reassurance. You just constantly are fishing. You're like the fishing for compliments person. You, you know that you know that person? The fishing. I, I, I say, do you know that person? I bet you all know that person. I mean. You know the person, but you also know the person. Like, you do this sometimes. We all do it. And if you're constantly doing it, then it's a sign that you're just a little bit overly needy. And the question for the day is not just like, hey, we're all needy. Thanks, Jesus. See you all later. Come back next week. That's not it. How do, we, how do we recover from it? And then if you know the people that are extremely needy in your life, what is it that you are to do to really love that person without hurting them, to help them without hurting them? I read a book one time, it was, I think it was called When Helping Hurts, and sometimes in your effort to help people, you can actually sabotage their potential for growth. And that's kind of what it is that I want to get into today because I want to be able to help us to navigate this thing effectively because I want to learn how to help people without hurting them and without hurting myself in the process. Right? Think about, think about the, um, the tension because Jesus, for example, Jesus cared more than any person ever. I mean, you just read the Bible. Jesus was a caring individual. But just because he cared for everyone, if you notice in the Bible, he didn't heal everyone. So there were times on his way to heal somebody, he would walk past somebody who was still sick. On his way to speak life into a situation, he would have to pass people who desperately needed the same thing that somebody else was about to receive. If that's the case, if Jesus couldn't even take the time to be able to interact and to be able to help in every single specific situation in the moment in which they needed it in a physical sense, then what makes us think that we're going to be able to do so? And so that being said, how do we love those people? Because most of the time, the needy people that are in our life are people that we really, really love. Because if we didn't really, really love them, we wouldn't really, really care. If there's a needy person that we don't love, we don't care as much. I mean, that just kind of goes without saying. But if there's somebody that's in your family and somebody that you do love, you really do want to help. And they could be a hot mess. They may be on the struggle bus, but you still love them. And you still want to be there for them. And you still want to be able to, to be able to help them. So how do you help them without enabling them, I guess, is where I'm going with this. How do you help the needy person without enabling them? There's three, three prayers, I think, is what I'm going to do. Three prayers that you can pray to help you help the needy person in such a way that will actually help them without hurting them. Here's the, here's the first one. Number one, you pray, you say, God, help me to give people what they need, not just what they want. You give people what they need, not just what they want. And the two are not 
always the same. How many of you know that to be true? Say true. What you need and what you want are not always the same. What somebody else says they need and what it is that they want are not always the same. I mean, there's a story in the Bible, for example. And uh, there was a guy who had been paralyzed from the time he was born. And his friends, they would bring him and put him outside the temple because back then all the Jewish people, which is where he lived, all the Jewish people had to go to the temple three times a day to pray. So it was a pretty hopping spot. I mean, this is, everybody had to go three times a day. So they would go and they would put him outside the temple. And when they would put him outside the temple, he would just sit there. I don't know if he had a cup. I don't know if he had a bucket. I don't know what he had. But he had something uh, in order to receive donations from people who were walking into church. I mean, it was, it was a very strategic place to go because you have all these people, many of whom feel guilty about something, and they're like, let's give the poor guy some money. And they would throw some money at him, walk into church, pray, come back out, do their thing. He went there every day because he needed money. It wasn't a typical beggar situation. It was a challenging scenario because back then, when you were in the predicament he was in, you weren't able to work. It's not as if he had any other options. This was his only option. And what he said that he really, really wanted was, was money. Well, Peter and John in the Bible, two pretty important uh, figures that are in the Bible. You read about them a lot when you read the New Testament. They're on their way into the temple. And on their way into the temple, the guy who was the beggar was sitting there, and he basically looks at them and says, can I have some money? Well, that's where we'll pick up. Acts chapter 3 says this, Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The guy wasn't even looking at him. He was just like asking random people for, for money. Give me money, give me money, give me money. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. In other words, I don't, it's the same excuse we all use. I don't have any cash, right? It's the same thing. And he says, but I am going to give you what I do have. And Peter pulls out his credit card. That's not what it is. It says, but I do, I am going to give you what it is that I do have. And watch what, watch what he says. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And that's, that's a pretty big deal. Peter took the lame man by the right hand and he helped him up. The man said that he wanted money. Peter and John knew that what he needed was different than that. He wanted some coins. What he needed was healing. And Peter and John could have easily just thrown him some cash or thrown him a quarter or whatever the case may be, but instead they took the time to not give him what it is that he wanted. He gave him what it is that he needed. And for us, one of the things that we have to, to discern is we have to, when it comes to the needy people that are in our life, we need to try to figure out a way to identify the real needs that, that are there. What's the real need? I'm not listening exclusively to what it is that you're saying. I need to also look at your actions so that I can see what is a root issue versus a fruit issue. See, the fruit issue was he did not have any resources. The root issue was he was unable to work because of his condition. Peter and John could have helped him with some fruit, but instead they helped him at the root, which in turn ended up changing the trajectory of his life forever. And that's what we have to do when it comes to the people in our life that are a little bit extra needy is we have to figure out ways to pay attention to their actions, not their words. Not every person who says they need more money actually needs more money. What it's code for is sometimes I need a job. I need a better job. Sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes it's I need to get my financial junk in order. I've met with people who make $100,000 plus a year who are in a financial mess and they're just telling me what they need is more income. No, you don't need more income. I I've seen the way you spend. And if you spend more than you make on a consistent basis, it does not matter how much income you have. It's not an income problem. It's a spending problem. That means it's a self-discipline self problem. You don't need more money. You need a budget. 
you, you need a little bit of discipline and the ability to tell yourself the word no or to tell yourself the word wait. Oh, it's just I can handle the monthly payment for the love of all things holy. Listen, what a great scheme, by the way, is to get the entire country thinking that as long as they can handle the monthly payment, they're good to go. I know this one's not popular because some of y'all, some of y'all, I mean, this is the way you live your life. You don't have a financial problem. You have an out-of-order problem. (laughs) Embrace the tension. (laughs) Hang out in the moment. Don't move on. Just sit here for a second. I don't know why I'm standing like that. That's weird. Sometimes, sometimes it's just that your financial house isn't in order. Sometimes it's that you are trying to find your contentment in stuff instead of realizing that your contentment can come from Christ alone, period. I've seen people that make $30,000 a year who live like kings and who are completely content. And I've seen people who are at the opposite end of the spectrum financially, and it's almost as if they have nothing doesn't matter how much money is in your bank account. I hope that your bank account increases. I hope every single person here is doing better financially next year than they are now, as long as your contentment and your hope is found in a person, not in the amount of zeros at the end of your paycheck. Does that make sense? Some don't need more likes on Instagram or TikTok or more approval from other people. What you need is to get your approval and your acceptance from God and realize he's the only one who can grant that to you, not somebody else. I used to get a lot of my approval and a lot of my identity was wrapped up week to week in how it is that I thought the message went on a Sunday. And I would walk off the stage. This is when we first started the church. I was was so young. And I would walk off the stage, and for the next week, my week, good or bad, would be dependent upon my perception of how the message went. Because I need to let you in on a secret. Sometimes when I walk off the stage, now I get to do it three times. So by the end of three, I know I'm going to have loved at least one of them. But if you're only preaching one, right, which I don't even know what that's like. If you only have to preach one message a Sunday, I don't even, I can't even wrap my brain around that. But if you only got one shot at it and you didn't love it, that would mess with my head when we first started. And I'd be like, I'm the worst pastor in the, in the world. Everybody hates that message. Nobody's coming back to church the next Sunday. And I would feel terrible for like seven days. Now, because I get to do it three times, it doesn't happen as much. But if there is a day where I walk off stage and I'm like, that just, that wasn't it. That, what, that, didn't, that didn't land the way I wanted it to. I didn't like it. I used to get mad for a week. Now I'm mad for an hour. And then I say, what are we having for dinner? And then I'm good because I've gotten to a point now, and I'm going to give you some negative examples of me in a minute, but I've gotten to a point now where that's not, my identity is not tied up in that as much. It's a, it's a really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing, by the way. But the same thing is true for every one of us. It's not, it's not about a like or a follow or uh, a share being bad. That's not bad. It just can't be where your identity comes from. Otherwise, you're going to be needing the approval of other people in order for you to feel content and it's not going to work. Because if you have to have all all eyes on you, one day you're going to wake up and realize that no eyes are on you. Nobody cares. Remember in middle school when you thought everybody was watching you on the way from the lunchroom back to, or from the way to get your tray back to your seat and then one day when you got older you realized nobody was watching? They were only watching and worrying about themselves. People are selfish. They're not worried about you. We base our whole identity on what we perceive other people think about us, and they're not thinking about us. (laughs) That's how messed up it is. Your whole identity is tied up in what somebody's thinking about you who's not even thinking about you. Yeah, ouch, that's true. (laughs) Where are we at? Number two, number one took forever. Number two, 
Oh, this one's good. God, help me stay out of your way by not rescuing people from the consequences of their actions. I hit more at 8.30. At 8.30, people must have been thinking of other people. Maybe at 10, y'all were thinking of yourselves. Lord, help me stay out of the way by not rescuing people from the consequences of their actions. Sometimes it's better to allow people to face the consequences of their choices. It is not your job to swoop in at every situation and try to be the hero. If that's your desire, you might be interacting with a needy person, but you have a Messiah complex and you're creating a codependent relationship. (laughs) And you're blaming them for being needy when you are just as much. It's just in a different way. Now, I'm not a counselor or a psychologist, but what I know is that I see this happen all the time. And in my profession as a pastor, I want to fix people sometimes. Sometimes I want to just like look at you and be like, I could fix you. Give me three minutes. I can fix you. <laughs> and I can't. I cannot fix people. I can't, I can't even fix my kids. My, I can't fix Devin. Devin certainly can't fix me, Lord. She's probably been trying for a long time. But we can't fix each other because I'm not the Messiah I'm not a savior. I'm J.R. <laughs> That's it. And sometimes you need to let people face the consequences. We have parents now. I remember when if we got in trouble at school, we got in more trouble at home. Now, sometimes kids get in trouble at school, and then the teacher gets yelled at. <laughs> you, you, talk, you can't. My little Johnny would never have done that. Your Johnny is a freak. And Johnny needs a spanking. That must have hit a nerve somewhere. Y'all must, everybody in here must know Johnny. We say this all the time. We say it from a, yeah, I even think about this from a a sports perspective with kids helping coach and different things. You can prepare, I'm going to mess this up, but you can prepare the path for the child or you can prepare the child for the path. A lot of people are trying to prepare a path and then your kids are gonna grow up and not know how to clear their own. And they all say that kids are growing up at a slower rate than they ever have, that it's taking longer for them to get out of adolescence. It's not the kid's fault, it's the parents. That's a whole nother subject. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling is the key word. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Rescuing is not always helping. Jesus is the Savior, not you. Now, just so you know, if somebody is drowning in the lake and you are on the dock, this is not a time for you to give them a speech about their choices. (laughs) Well, why did you jump in if you can't swim, you little idiot? That's not the time. What you do is you grab the life preserver and you throw it to them. And then if you need to yell at them later, you can. Sometimes they just need a life preserver. But at other times... You need to let them just deal with the consequences. You just have to be wise enough to know, is this going to kill them if I don't help? Literally kill them. And I'm using the word literally the proper way. I'm not using it like I'm literally starving to death. No, you're not. You could go weeks without food. You'd be fine. Does this make sense? Be wise enough to know the difference. Sometimes you need to allow people to face the consequences of their choices. There's so much more I I need to say, but I I don't have time. Number three, here's a good one. God help me remember that I'm also that guy or that girl. I said guy though, because I'm a guy. So it'd be weird if I said, God help me to realize that I'm also that girl. (laughs) But why did he say guy? Because I am one. That's why. People lost their minds in this country. (laughs) 
I don't even, I didn't even mean for that to be what it was, but it's true. We have lost our dang minds. I'm so tempted to keep going. <laughs> Psalm chapter 70, verse 5. <laughs> but as for me, I am poor and needy. Please hurry to my aid, O God. You are my helper and you are my savior. O Lord, do not delay. What a mature and humble statement to say, guilty. God, I need you. I am needy, and I need you. I need you. See, the flip side is, is to walk out of here and be like, I'm not needy at all. Then you've missed the whole point. Because we're all needy, and that's actually not a bad thing. That's a good thing. The reason that I say that it's good is because the requirement to receive the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and have that applied in our life, to have forgiveness of our sin. The requirement is to admit that you have a need. Say, Lord, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I need, I need you to do it for me. I'm needy. Religion can't do it. I can't do it. Going to church won't do it. Being a decent person won't do it. None of that's going to do it. I need you. That's what it is that we have to be willing to admit. The challenge is, is that for those of us who stay needy forever because you're constantly looking to other people to fulfill what only God can provide. So today, my, my prayer, really, more than anything, is to help us to be able to interact with, with those that are needy, but to also be able to learn that we are needy at times in our relationships with others, and we can get better. At other times, we need to learn and admit that we are needy before God, and we seek to ask Him to fill our need. I mean, that's a requirement if you want to know that your sin's been forgiven. If you want to know that heaven is your home, that your life's been changed, you have to admit your need. For me, that happened when I was 16 years old. I admitted my need of forgiveness. And God changed me in a moment, did more in a moment than religion could have done in a lifetime. And for some of you, that's going to happen for you today. It's going to literally happen today. So if you're here, all over the room, those in the room, those watching online, would you bow your head? close your eyes. If you're here today and you would say, you know what? I need to put my trust and my hope in Jesus and what he has done and what he can do in my life. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. He did all that for me. He paid the penalty that I should have paid. And now as a result, I want to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And as a result, I can be forgiven, saved, changed, and all things can become brand new in my life. So if that's you, you're ready. You're ready to admit your need to him. Whether you're in the room or you're watching online, you're ready to have your sin forgiven. You're ready to have your life changed. If that's you, just pray this prayer with me. As I prayed out loud, just pray it in your own heart. Say, Lord, the best way I know how, I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus. I confess that you are Lord and I believe in my heart that you have been risen from the dead and on this day, I'm asking you to forgive me, to save me, to change me, and to make all things new. No matter how it is you walked into this room, if that's your prayer, right where you are, just tell the Lord, say, Lord, I need you right now. With your head still bowed, eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer with me, you just said yes to Jesus right where you are. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. I'm not going to have you stand or anything like that. But I do want to be able to see where you are so that I can celebrate with you and pray with you and let you know that, that was the greatest decision that you could ever make. If you're in the room, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. When I say three, you're going to raise your hand high and you're going to leave it up just for three or four or five seconds until I tell you to put it down. If you're watching online, when I say three, right there in the chat, you can just type in the chat, just type saying yes to Jesus. It's right where you are so that we can have a record 
of you saying yes to Jesus as well. Because just like we celebrate those that say yes in the building, we want to celebrate those who said yes to Jesus literally all over the country like we do every single week. So when I say three, you throw your hand up high right where you are. You ready? One, two, three. Raise your hand high if you just say yes to Jesus today. I see your hands. I see you. One, two, three, four, five. Who else? Raise a high. That's good. You can put your hands down. If you're watching online, just type saying yes to Jesus right where you are. Do me a favor, everybody here. Y'all stand to your feet. Real quick, just stand to your feet. And I'm going to pray for you. Uh, we're not done yet. we got a couple more things. Ushers, lock the doors. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, but only sort of. Uh, I'm going to pray for you real quick. And I forgot what I was going to do. Oh, yeah. If you are, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So, so far in 2021, right, we're in April right now, right? January, February, March, April. We're in April. So far in 2021, we've had over 500 first-time guests. Uh, at Freedom Church, which is crazy. And even even better is that uh, in 2021, so far, 300 people, not including today, 300 people have said yes to Jesus, which is phenomenal. So that being said, uh, your next step, if you've said yes to Jesus and not been baptized since that day, your next step is baptism. So I want to get you registered. We want to sign you up. We want to help you take your next step. It's that important. So here's what you're going to do. If you said yes to Jesus today, or if you have said yes to Jesus previously, but you've never been baptized, I want you to pull out your phone. Matter of fact, everybody pull out your phone real quick, just for solidarity. Just pull out your phone. If your mom told you you're not allowed to touch it, I'm going to override her authority just for a second. Just pull it out. And uh, what I want you to do is if you're interested in taking that next step or if you said yes to Jesus, uh, I want you to just text the word NEXT, N-E-X-T, to the number that you see on the screen and uh, we'll be able to help you take your next step. If you said yes to Jesus on your way out, we have a little booklet that we want to put in your hands. Just get that at the Next Steps booth as you walk out into the lobby. We're going to sing one more song, do one more thing. Let me pray for you, dear Lord. I love you. I'm grateful for you. I thank you for every person that's here today. I pray that you would do something significant in their heart and life. Thank you for those that said yes to Jesus. Thank you for what you've already started. I pray that you would continue to help us for our need to be filled by you instead of us looking to other people to do what only you were created to do or what only you can do. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.